um, hard to find anyone who supports you when you say, I don't think I'm going to die of HIV or AIDS. This, the typical model of HIV equals AIDS equals death, uh, how invested am I going to be in that model? Everyone who's infected with HIV would like to deny it. I mean, it's a bad prognosis. It means you're going to take drugs for the rest of your life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's people who want to say, ah, I'm one of the people who tested positive, but I'm not going to get the disease. Do I start treatment? Treatment meaning the antiviral drugs, if ever? We started taking Lindsay to a doctor at the Children's Medical Clinic. She gave us a prescription for uh, retrovir syrup, which is AZT. It was so important for us to get something to help our baby that we sat on the floor in the pharmacy and gave her her first dose. Shortly after Lindsay began AZT treatment, side effects began to emerge. Her eating habits changed quite a bit. She didn't eat well. She was hard to handle at the table. And then the leg cramps started. Once that started, it got progressively worse. She would just grab him and go, oh, you know, screaming in the middle of the night. Just like it was a, it wasn't an ache, it was like, must have been sharp pains. It just, just made you feel sick to your stomach. Any drug active on the HIV would be toxic because it's not 100% specific of the HIV enzymes. When we switched over to the university, then the dosage of AZT went up, and that's where she started flattening out on her uh, growth chart. The doctors would try to put a, a positive spin on how well she was progressing. It was, it was mainly in the T cells that weren't always a positive situation. Yeah, the T cell count would go down, and then the doctors would say, well, maybe we better raise that AZT dosage, get that T cell count back up. We are going, I think it's kind of making her sick because she doesn't want to eat. She's having leg cramps. And they'd say, well, it's the HIV, and that's what it does. It's all part of the package. The treatment causes a very similar condition we would expect from an AIDS patient. That's why nobody noticed that there was something wrong with the treatment. I remember in 1992, after I first tested positive, I became involved in an organization called Women at Risk. There were 11 of us at the time on the board and involved in the group. All of us except three were on the medications. In the year and a half that I was involved with Women at Risk, every single woman in that organization on the drugs died. Every single one except the three of us who weren't taking them. We weren't just given handfuls of AZT, we demanded it. AZT, We considered the FDA not giving us these things as being anti-gay instead of being responsible. And so we went and we lobbied and we pushed for all these things and we didn't think clearly about what it was we were asking for. It's like that saying, be, caref be careful what you ask for, it may come to pass. That's the very reason why everybody believes HIV is a deadly virus, because the HIV-positive patient at that time got a deadly treatment. Despite the billions spent on the drug, tens of thousands of people with AIDS have died. And now a growing number of studies are questioning the drug's usefulness. We just decided between ourselves in, um, in November to write to Peter Duisberg and say, sorry to bother you. Are you for real? And if Lindsay were your daughter, what would you do? On November 11th, we got a big package. And he said, you must take your daughter off AZT immediately, or she will die from it like Kimberly Bagalis. That is AIDS by prescription. You get immunodeficiency and you die from the tox. That is AIDS by prescription. When AZT became widely available in, in 1985 and 1986, uh, I cautioned my patients not to jump on the bandwagon and start being treated. I didn't want to see my community poisoned by an ineffective therapy. 
I think in retrospect the dose that we started with with AZT was uh, a dangerous and uh, poorly tolerated dose. Nobody wants to realize uh, what what was the real effect of this overtreatment. That means that we killed a whole generation of AIDS patients. In 96, David Ho announced highly active antiretroviral therapy. Also known as the cocktail, because the treatment combined the newly developed protease inhibitors with older HIV drugs, such as the chemotherapy drug AZT. That was a revolution. What was a 100% um, fatal illness now could be treated. The AIDS medication today is not that toxic than it was in the early days. And it's a potent uh, drug regime that means it kills almost everything. I play around with treatment interruption because I think the drugs are toxic. And if I do the drugs continuously without interruption, I think that they'll have a cumulative um, damage. In the years that we've been using the cocktail, we've found that there are lots of side effects. In South Africa, I spoke to a couple of pharmacists specializing in HIV treatment. How often do you see side effects in patients? Yeah. All, all the time. Yeah, all the time. Almost all the time. We saw the lipodystrophy, the buffalo humps at the back of the neck, then the lipoatrophy, which is the loss of uh, fat in the face and the arms, giving people a very gaunt look. The risk of heart attacks seems to be increased in people on these drugs. Uh, with what we have now, the side effects eventually are going to outweigh the benefits. So uh, patients really do better for the short term, but in the long term, they, uh, they die also. In 1994, Audrey Serrano tested HIV positive. While initially healthy, she was prescribed AIDS drugs, which nearly killed her and left her scarred for life. In December 2007, after multiple negative tests, she was awarded $2.5 million in damages. Some people are very fortunate. They don't have these side effects, but many people do. So prolonged treatment is impossible. I know people that are like horses, have no impact with some drugs, no side effects, and somebody else falls apart. The new uh, generation of uh, antiretroviral drugs are less toxic. They can be more t tolerated. But for how long? This, I agree. We cannot give a treatment for life. It's, it's not like insulin, you know, it's, uh, it's something which is toxic. Has a patient ever died from the side effects? Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes it happens. AIDS drugs are all classified as black box drugs. A black box drug is th the most severe warning that our FDA will put on a product. It means you could die taking this because other people have died taking this. My sister Joyce was my best friend. She's a great mom and uh, just a very lively person. In 2003, Joyce found out she was pregnant with a second child. She was offered an HIV test as standard prenatal care by her obstetrician. She called me at work. And she was like, I got something to tell you. And I was like, well, what is it? She said, I'm HIV positive. So I took a deep breath. I said, well, it's not the end of the world. And she said, well, now I met this doctor today, and he's a specialist. And he says, is there some medicines I can take that'll keep my baby from being HIV positive? Nevirapine. Warning. Severe life-threatening skin reactions, including fatal cases, one morning, she was covered in these welts and this rash. It was all over her face, it was all over the, her chest, all over her arms, her hands. When they're talking about a rash that can kill you, they're talking about a, a drug that targets the, the actively replicating cells in your dermis, in, in your mucosal layers, in your intestine and stops them from working. And what happens? Good, goodbye skin. I would never take them. I, I look at, I, I, I don't have a problem with other people taking them. 
But I, as Criselda Cananda personally, looking at the side effects that they come with, looking at